Good morning, everybody. Welcome to everybody in this room. Welcome to all those joining us online. Our text uh, reminded me of a story a few years ago. I was in a kind of a casual conversation with an orthopedic surgeon, and he was outlining kind of what a week's life in his life, packed schedule, and uh, crazy surgeries, and patient load, and on call, and on and on and on. And then he turned to me and he said, man, I just wish I had a job like you as a pastor. He just said, man, you just, you just work one day a week. I mean, your schedule is amazing. He said, what do you do with all your free time? And it would have been kind of funny, but it realized he was dead serious. So this gentleman went from world-class orthopedic surgeon to you're an idiot in like five seconds in my head. You know? I don't think I'm alone in this struggle though, right? <laughs> like this, the text gets at when Jesus is addressing this core part of our humanity where we just have this pull and this propensity to kind of what I'm going to call banish others, to kind of categorize and write them off. And I came across a quotation I put in your notes. If you haven't pulled out your message notes, online community, your host can direct you there. But this is a professor of sociology up at Villanova University, Dr. Jill McCorkle. She said this, cancel culture is an extension of or a contemporaneous evolution of a much bolder set of social processes that we can see in the form of banishment, right? And all you have to do is send the wrong tweet or make the wrong quote or post the wrong post at the wrong time, and your hashtag capital R-I-P, that's what's the new thing, right? You're just done. And it's this, there's something deep inside the human heart that has this propensity to write people off, to banish them, to categorize them, to polarize and I'm just glad that in our current North American climate, maybe, let's just imagine if we might be in a struggle bus. I think we're on struggle street with this issue, right? And so, Jesus' words today, I think, find themselves in a space that is so neat. It's as if He wrote them for 2021, um, just so poignantly placed. When in the opening line of Matthew 7, he uses a statement that's often quoted even by people outside the Christian community. Jesus' line gets tossed around, do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, the interesting and ironic part is if you know the rest of chapter 7, you know Jesus then proceeds to offer an evaluation and a judgment through the rest of 7, <laughs> like good trees and bad trees, wide gate, narrow gate, wise builder, foolish builder. So you're like, wait, 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 Jesus, either your massive contradiction here in verse 1 to the rest of the chapter, or what I'm going to argue today is not contradiction, but it's brilliant. It's brilliant as only Jesus could do. So let's unpack. We're going to look at today. Is kind of, what does he mean by the statement, do not judge? Because I think we've really got to get a firm grounding on this word. Now, when we talk about the definition or the meaning of a word, you're talking about its semantic or lexical range. Like when you pull out a dictionary and you're looking up a word, there's a number of words in a range of meanings. And so on one end of the array, the range of meanings for the word judge, I put in your notes there, right? There's this word that means to evaluate, to separate things into good or bad, right or wrong, helpful or not helpful. That's one definition of the word judge is to evaluate. So the question is, is this what Jesus is forbidding? Is he saying you don't ever say to another person, you're wrong? You don't criticize someone else's beliefs. You don't do that. You don't criticize their behavior. You don't say that's wrong because that's being judgy. You're just being judgmental. Is that what Jesus is getting at? Because that's how today our culture applies often this statement. It's that banner of, well, my belief is my belief, my values are my values, and you just need to deal with them. And if you have a commentary or an evaluation on someone else's belief or values, you're immediately cast aside into a category of Judge Judy, right? You're just super judgmental. And so the question is, is this what Jesus is forbidding? 
I want to say two things in response. I think it's fairly obvious. No, number one, a bulk of Jesus' life, teachings, and ministry recorded through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a bulk of them are in the category of providing an evaluation. The moment Jesus comes on the scene, if you know your New Testament well, what's the opening statement He makes publicly? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That that would be a statement of evaluation. Repent means to turn, meaning, hey, the way you're going about your life, the way you're choosing to handle your time, priorities, and values, Jesus says, you're going the wrong way. It's an evaluation. It's a statement of judgment. It's saying, that's the wrong road. Repent, turn, and I'm going to paint a road for you called the right road, the kingdom of heaven. And it's like Dallas Willard said, Reality is what you run into when you're wrong. I'm going to say that again because I think it's right over somebody. Reality is what you run into when you're wrong. And Jesus is on the scene to paint a picture and to bring the reality of the kingdom of heaven here and now. Make up there, come down here. In the Lord's prayer, he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus brings an evaluation, a reality, a judgment, a clarification. He does that through his entire ministry and life. So clearly he can't be saying we're not supposed to do that because his whole ministry is set up around that. Secondly, I would say another reason I don't think he's referring to that part of the word judge is that when you say today, when we say today, quote, you should never negatively evaluate another's behavior. You should never tell people they're wrong, end quote. Now think with me now. We're going to We're going to engage the mind. you got an extra hour of sleep, so I'm going to go strong on this today, right? We're all rested up, right? We're ready to go today. Amen? All right. Three people over here on my left are ready to go. Let's go. So when you say this statement, all right, I'm going to say it again. When this statement, think it through now. You should never negatively evaluate another's behavior. You should never tell people they're wrong. At that moment, huh? You're telling the person, right? You tracking with me? You're telling that person that they're wrong by negatively evaluating another's behavior. Are you tracking with me? It doesn't make basic logical sense is what I'm going to bring up. The statement itself is an indictment on the gap. No, that's not what Je- when Jesus says don't judge, he's not saying don't provide a critical evaluation. Don't assess things as good, bad, true, false, false, wise, unwise. Of course, that's a critical part of being a human and a critical part of being a follower of Jesus in the kingdom of God. We have to be a people who provide a wise evaluation. So that's not what he's getting at, which raises the question, well, then what is the other kind of on the other end of the lexical range, the semantic meaning of this word judge, we can go to the parallel passage in Luke 6. I put in your notes, Luke 6, 37. This is the parallel to the Matthew 7 text. Jesus says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. There it is, church. There's our window. There's a kind of judgment, follow me here, that leads to condemnation and categorization. That's what fractures and separates relationships. And that's the step that Jesus is saying is out of bounds. The New Testament term he uses in the Greek, I put it in your notes, it's called krino. Say krino. So krino means to evaluate, separate, separate, criticize, and categorize. So I thought we'd do for a moment here just to unpack what is Jesus getting at. Let's talk about bad crino and good crino. You with me? So here's the bad crino, right? The bad judgment. Bad crino is a kind of judgment that leads to condemnation, that banishes others. This is bad crino. It separates people into categories like good and bad, orthodox and heretic. It's, that's the bad crino. It's when you look at what someone has said or posted and what someone has perhaps done, and you make some kind of judgment about the kind of person they are. That's the move, bad crino. That's the move that Jesus is outlawing. 
So when someone like observes a person's tweet or post and then makes a judgment and categorizes them as an idiot or a loser, that, that's the move that's bad crino. Most, if not all, interaction on social media is bad crino. Anybody else feeling that? Only me, I guess. Because if you just follow the comment thread on a controversial, it's almost all bad crino. It's everybody calling everybody else in someone else's camp a loser and an idiot. That's not what Jesus is. That's the bad crino. That's what he's outlawing for his followers, a banishment of others by categorizing and condemning. That's what he means by do not judge. Bad crino. Well, what's good crino then? I'm glad you asked. The good crino is to separate things into wise, unwise, good, bad, helpful, not helpful, true, false. It's to provide an evaluation. That's good crino. That's basic discipleship to Jesus. I would say that's basic human development. To make a judgment that you are using in this situation and you apply it to yourself first. We'll get into that more in a moment, but that's good crino. Before you move to confront someone else or something else, you take a moment and kind of self-examine in here how things are going in your own heart. We'll attach a word to good crino. It's called discernment. The word to bad crino, condemnation. We're called to exercise discernment, but not condemnation. That's the overarching, what is Jesus talking about? Do not judge, exercise discernment, not condemnation. Don't go down to categorizing and polarizing and labeling and banishing others accordingly. That's the move Jesus is outlining here with the statement, do not judge or you too will be judged. So when you read a passage like 2 Peter Chapter 2, verse 1. Look at what Peter says about this. But there were also false prophets among the people. Huh, if the only way you could categorize a false prophet is if you're making an evaluation. Just as there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. You can't classify one destructive heresy unless you're making a judgment, providing an evaluation, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. So good crino, discernment, the separation of things, of actions, of views and beliefs. Bad crino, condemnation, the separation of people, categorizing and criticizing others to punish and banish, to just get rid of them with an atmosphere of kind of haughty condescension. That's the bad, bad crino stuff. And the move Jesus is outlying, it can be summarized with this. The move is, I really disagree with what you said. This is the move he's outlined, outlawing. I disagree with what you said. The move is, don't do that. You're an idiot. That's the move. Nope, that's, what he, that's the out of bounds. But the move he's not outlawing is the statement of discernment, of providing a wise assessment, true, false, good, bad, wise, unwise. Listen to what Oswald Chambers says. I put this in your notes as well. Whenever you are in a critical temper, it is impossible to enter into communion with God. Criticism makes you hard and vindictive and cruel and leaves you with the flattering unction that you are a superior person. It is impossible to develop the characteristics of a saint and maintain a critical attitude. And when you try to summarize the last 20 months of what we've been living through as a nation in particular, but as a world as a whole, I think we need a little help here. It's like month 20, but who's counting? I guess I'm counting. So, 20 months in, and does anybody feel kind of the waves of intensity that just, it can just kind of wear you down. It can be exhausting to be a human in this world today and to have any type of leadership position in any type of capacity, be that in your home or in the marketplace or in a ministry or in a school any type of leadership position, you are thrust into just a relentless, what I think is a confusion around this very topic that Jesus is addressing. To make a critical evaluation about something and it runs against the grain of the other person, that we're not handling that well. 
And I think it can be better, and that's the call. So, what is Jesus referring to here? He's calling us to be a people who exercise good crino, to provide wise discernment. This is the principle, to be a person of discernment without going down the path of condemnation, categorizing, polarizing, and banishing. There's the principle. You still with me? If you're still with me, say crino. All right, we've got some people still with me. Now, we're going to take a breath now, come up. We're going to breathe for a little bit here, and let's get into the how. Like, like practically, you say, okay, Pastor, I appreciate that clarification, but how does this make, how do I practically work this way out in my life? I'm glad you asked. That's what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about. Like, well, because Jesus' metaphor, here's why, it's brilliant. It's br- that's what he does from verse 3 to 5. 1 and 2 is the principle. 3 to 5 is how it works its way out. So we got three things like practically, like tomorrow morning when you get up and get about your week, what should we be doing to move this forward? Number one, Jesus says, look at verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? So here's the metaphor. It's this classic plank speck of dust that he unpacks. Okay, here's how I want you to know how to go down the path of Provide a critical evaluation, but don't condemn. This is what he is. Think of it like speck, plank in your eye. So the first thing is to recognize what affects your ability to see clearly. This is the first principle. You've got to recognize what affects your ability to see clearly. One of my first jobs as a teenager, I worked for Kendra's stepfather. He owned like a woodworking business, and so he had like a large wood shop. He made custom cabinets and other things and taught me all kinds of stuff that I don't implement very well in my adult life, but he did a really good job of trying to instruct me. And so I, I would often be running like the table saw or the planer or the band saw, and of course, Larry would be frequently saying, don't forget to put your safety glasses on, don't put your goggles on. And less than 50% of the time, you know, teenage boy, that I was following these instructions. And sure enough, especially when I ran the planer, if you know what wood planers are like, I mean, it's just a dust and wood chips flying everywhere. And one time I remember I slide a big piece of wood in and poof, it hit me right in the face. And I had this, this speck get lodged in my eye. And if you've ever been in that setting, you know that, thing, I mean, it just, my eye turned red and it was watering like crazy. I couldn't see and... Like that, right, like that got lodged in there, like this speck gets lodged. And I just, I couldn't see, I couldn't continue the work. I had to shut the saw up, go to the bathroom, flush out the eye, that whole drill. And here's the, see, Jesus is saying, this is, this is what happens when sin gets lodged in our soul. It's like a speck of sawdust that gets lodged in your eye. It affects your ability to see. So, a woman who's growing up, who starts dating, who starts meeting a young man, and whose life is so, the fracture of trust, her heart is so broken by a fracture of trust with this man. And that gets lodged in her soul in such a way that now, as she's grown a little bit older, she doesn't understand how that splinter lodged in her soul is coloring all her relational worlds. Or the business leader who's pushing so hard to succeed and achieve and accomplish, he can't see how that drivenness has gotten lodged in his soul in such a way that it's really undermining a lot of the things at home that he says he wants to be about. He can't see it, right? We all have these things, right? There are desires that are out of bounds. There's hidden habits. There's fears. There's anxieties. There's bitternesses. There's grudges from the past. They get lodged in your soul like a splinter that gets in your eye and distorts your ability to see. And when that happens, what do you need? You need someone to help you. You need help to get it out. That's the second principle that I wrote down in your notes, right? Understand we can't do this on our own. You say, well, Eric, all you need is a mirror. Well, you realize in first century Palestine, like there were virtually no mirrors. When you got something lodged in your eye in Jesus' day, you had to have someone help you get it out. You couldn't just go to a mirror and flush out. Only the wealthiest of the wealthy had a mirror. And so you had to have someone come alongside you and help you remove that splinter that is in your eye. And the application here, right? We need people to help us. We need people to come and tell us the truth, 
to show us what's lodged in our soul. We need that. We need people to provide an evaluation for people to come and talk to us. But hear this now. We need Him to come and talk to us and to tell us the truth with the same kind of measure someone would do when they're removing a splinter from an eye, with gentleness, with humility, with thoughtfulness, with graciousness. Like if you had something stuck in your eye and someone came at you with like a power garden hose, you'd go, whoa, whoa you know, like that's a little aggressive, right? Or someone comes at you with a really large set of tweezers, going to go in there and, oh, you know, we need to no, you're looking for a Kleenex, and you're looking for some eye drops, and you're looking for gentleness, thoughtfulness, humility, graciousness. That's the way you approach another brother or sister to talk about what's lodged in their soul is the way you would approach someone who has a splinter in their eye, that kind of approach. That's the metaphor. Isn't it brilliant what Jesus is bringing up here? It's this. It's like the way you would tell someone about their faults is you would approach it like you would someone with a splinter in their eye. And then he presses it, because just like Jesus would do, he presses it to verse 4. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? So here's kind of the third thing, right? The first step, Jesus says, how you're going to work this way out, you first got to recognize, hey, what's lodged in your own soul that's affecting your ability to see? What's the splinters in there? And number two, understand, you can't deal with that on your own. You're going to have to have someone help you which is why the judgment, the good crino, bad crino is so important because you have to have someone in your life provide a wise, critical evaluation of good, bad, true, false, false, wise, unwise to you. But to do it in such a way with gentleness, gently, humbly, graciously, thoughtfully. And then number three, you start with self. A one obvious level of application with the plank, the two by four analogy here Say, hey, before you start picking a speck out of brother's eye, deal with the plank in your own eye. One obvious application is, you know, sometimes we can be really, really good at seeing the faults and weaknesses in others and not have a very good self-awareness on your own issues. That's, that's one level of application for sure. But I think Tim Keller, uh, who's a brilliant pastor out in New York, Tim Keller makes the point that when you have a speck of dust in your eye, it feels like a two by four to you. Boy, isn't that true? I remember on that day by the planes, I mean, I felt like I had a two by four in my eye, and it was just this tiny little piece of wood, but it feels like the smallest splinter of wood looks and feels really large when it's lodged in your eye. It's like a plank. Listen to what Keller says. I put this in your notes. Unless your sins loom large to you, unless you see your issues as greater than other people's issues, you're not going to be able to help them with the stuff that's lodged in their soul. Are you tracking with this? That there's, got to be, there's this gentleness and thoughtfulness and humility needed in approaching other people's specs. Do you know where that kind of attitude flows from? The person who understands the two by four that's lodged in their own soul. The clearer you come to understand your own struggles, your own weaknesses, your own pride, your own selfishness, your own pity, pettiness, all of that stuff, all that stuff that gets lodged in here, the more honest you are, the more personal ownership you take there, the better position you're in to help a brother or sister out in dealing with the speck in their own eye. The other side of the application would be fairly cautious in allowing someone to start picking around in your soul and dealing with the splinters there who don't really have a firm grasp of the two-by-four issues in their own soul. And that would, the shift from good crino to bad crino is often associated with that move right there. And can you imagine, church, for a moment, can you imagine what it would be like to be a community like, to be a part of a community like this? Especially today, when Jesus describes the church like a city on a hill, wouldn't we be a city on a hill, like a group of people who actually live in community and relationship with each other, who have some measure of reflection of this kind of a way of being with one another? Wouldn't that be amazing? 
Wouldn't that be an amazing gift of raising up young people in this world who understand what it means to be a people of good crino and can also spot out bad crino, but can deal with a bad crino with a gentleness and a humility and a love and a graciousness that flows out of their own self-awareness of the two-by-four stuff in their own eye? Wouldn't that be amazing? I think it could be magnetic. I think it could be powerful. I I think it would have an unbelievable impact in this world. And I'm thankful that for 28 years, being with all of you and being together, I see that happening in different ways in the Eagle family through different years and experiences, right? Every church family, we go through tough stuff. We go through amazing stuff. We go through highs and lows. And one of the things when I look at a Jen Aldridge and a Mike and Sharon Swathwood, and I look at 28 plus years of investment in a local community, and you just see a gentleness and a humility and a graciousness that comes from a family and a person who's just chosen to stay. And I'm just going to be a part of a family that, you know, not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect community of Jesus followers because guess what's all there? Broken people. And we all have our own share of set of brokenness. And Dallas Willard says, well, you need to jump into a church family because you have to actually practice loving your enemies. And he says, you'll find a few at church. So just jump in. And so you'll kind of be around church. And if you hang around church family, if you hang around here long enough, guess what you're going to run into? Someone who just kind of runs against the grain of your own preferences. Someone who irritates you. Maybe that's me. Someone who gets on your nerves or someone who just, you're going to run into that. What do you do? That's the, that's the fuel. That's the ingredients that Jesus uses to form his life and his character in his people in the context of community. It's a beautiful thing to have where you just stay together and stick together and row through the seasons of life together and hopefully by His grace exercising a bit more good crino and a bit less bad crino. And we do that together with one another. Because in this culture today, it appears to me we've got like the polarization of like two camps strongly seems going on. It's the love, love, no truth camp and the truth, truth, no love camp. You tracking me? So it's love, love, no truth, or truth, truth, no love. C.S. Lewis said, the enemy always sends errors in pairs. So when you turn from one, you fall headlong into the other. I think that's what's going on here. Because some of you have a temperament, and you've been raised in an environment where the concept of confrontation and conflict, you just shrink back from it. Like nothing, and you're just a peacemaker at your core. And you're a wonderful gift to the community, to your family. Yes, But here's the tension. You can just kind of land in the love, love, no truth camp when you're wired and predisposed and raised to kind of avoid conflict. The caution here is you can end up avoiding some really important conversations that need to be had with others. That's the tendency. Now, there's others of you in the other camp. You, your temperament and your environment with your rage, like you're just looking for a good confrontation. Like you feel like you got a PhD in conflict. Like you can just run into it and you know, sometimes you'll describe yourself as, I liked it when people say, well, I'm just a straight shooter. I'm just a straight talker. I've learned that's just a nice way of saying you're really abrasive. Right? I mean, I get, but we're just wired a certain way. It's okay to respect each other's wiring, but do you see, it's like today we're in this camp of either clamming up or blowing up. That need, that's like what's going on, like we're pushed into these places, and Jesus is pulling us into this middle space of speaking the truth in love, of dealing with a speck in a brother or sister's eye the way you would deal with a speck of sawdust gently, humbly, thoughtfully, graciously. And the best space to do that from is understanding you've got your own two-by-four sized issues to work through and to deal with. So, the principle for the day is this. You become a person who exercises good crino by navigating this pull in our fallenness, like sin nature and the culture we're in is going to pull us to bad crino. I think there's a direct correlation between the amount of time you spend in social media world and the temptation for bad crino. I don't know. You You track it in your own life. Just see. I see a correlation between the more time I spend in social media world and the pull to go bad crino. And so we need to be thoughtful then about, okay, the pull is to be a people of discernment without a people of condemnation, categorization, and banishment. And how do we do that? 
Number one, we recognize what's affecting our ability to see clearly. We've got to be honest about the splinters in our own soul. And then number two, we've got to understand, we can't deal with those splinters on our own. We need one another. That's why around here we're always calling you into sacred and spiritual community. All of you have a ton of relationships, no doubt. What I observe often in suburban North America, especially more white-collar professional leadership folks, is relationally exhausted but lonely because they're just spent relationally in their working worlds, laying it out for all these other people. But genuinely, if they were honest in the core of their being, they're really not known by anyone. That's a dangerous space. We need one another. We need what's called spiritual friendships. Who are the relationships in your life that help you seek God? That's a spiritual friendship. The relationships in your life that help you seek God. We need that. That's one of the primary ways, that, that's one of the primary means the church provides an environment where those relationships can be fostered because we need one another to help deal with the splinters in our own soul. And then thirdly, we commit to start with self. Good crino starts with understanding a two-by-four, multiple two-by-fours in your own soul before you start moving out and picking on all the specks out in everyone else's soul. I hadn't been a pastor for, I don't know, I maybe been four or five years, and I remember it was out in the atrium, it was out in the atrium at our facility down in um, Pike Township, and I remember um, it was one of those conversations. It was a group of parents, and they said, Pastor Eric, we'd like to speak with you. We have some concerns. I thought, okay, I'm new at this. I don't even know what that means. So I huddled up out in the atrium lobby area, and there was like, I don't know, eight or ten parents, and they were, they'd clearly kind of put their thoughts together, and they had outlined, and they wanted to explain to me a deep-seated concern that they had as parents about our youth group at that time. I said, Pastor Eric, we've gotten word that there's a group of students hanging out in the church parking lot before the youth group meeting, and they're smoking. Like smokers, and we're pretty sure they're not really peep, they're not kids that are really connected to a lot of our families, so they're like kids we don't know really well, and they're kids that are smoking, and they're coming like before youth group meeting, and then they're smoking in the parking lot, and then they come into youth group. I listened. And here was my response, as I recall it. I said something to this effect. Isn't that awesome? I said, that's amazing. I said, how cool is that, that we've got a group of young people who are smoking in the parking lot before they come into the youth group? Isn't it cool that they think this is a group that they could connect with? I think Jesus is the kind of Savior that had a lot of gatherings where there was smoking in the parking lot before the gathering. Isn't that great that our student ministry could provide that environment and that that group of kids would come? I think the bigger concern should be when we don't have that happening. Dead silence. Let me just say I did not receive good crino. I'll leave it at that. I didn't get the pastor of the day award with that group. The church, do you see it? Do you Jesus' vision for cancel culture is what? That we would be the kind of community <laughs> where the person who's blind, who's lame, who's Bartimaeus, where the Samaritan woman at the well who's had five husbands and she's living with a guy who's not even her sixth yet, that those kinds of folks, the one who is lost, the one who is lame, the one who is blind, the one who's known they've done way too much and God's surely given up on them, that we'd be the kind of community that would throw our arms and our doors open wide and say, let me introduce you to a Savior who is so gracious and so loving and so kind. That's the vision Jesus has for His church. The vision for His church is not to be a PhD in cancel culture. Come on now. I know you've all got incredibly wise things to provide commentary about and all kinds of things going on in our culture, and that's fine to provide it with this grid today. We've got to have some self evaluation Let's make sure the work we're doing as followers of Jesus in a world that clearly is needing some help. This is called good crino evaluation. 
the current trajectory of our culture is needing what the old school saints would say, a revival, a spiritual awakening. We need an outpouring of the Spirit on our land and upon our nation that causes our leaders and the whole thrust of our culture to fall on their face before a holy God. That's what we need. Absolutely, we pray to that end. And as a church, that's what we're committed to, and we're going to stay here, and we're going to keep gathering, and we're going to keep preaching this Word, and we're going to keep, keep submitting ourselves to what God has to say about these things. Yes, that's what we do. That's called providing a wise evaluation. That's providing a critical view. This is the voice of authority, not all the other voices, students, Listen to me loud and clear. When you go into your classroom and you sit underneath a professor with three or four PhDs by their name, make sure that just what they're espousing is in line with here before you adopt a worldview that they're painting. Because everything they say isn't in the category of wisdom just because they've got some office, some nameplate, and several letters by their name. This has time-tested, valued, approved, right? This defines, right? This is what we submit ourselves to. Students, this is why we ground you here from the youngest of age. By the time you go to student ministry, you will have gone through Genesis to Revelation twice in your elementary years. So when you go up to student ministry through middle school and high school, what do you do? Genesis to Revelation. Preach the Word. Teach the Word. Keep Jesus at the center. Why? Why? Because we want to train you. We want to equip you. We want to ground you to go out into this world and be a light. Be a beacon of light and help turn the tide and clearly a tide that needs turned. This is what it means to be a community that Jesus had a vision for. It's called His church. And we band together and we say, you know what? There's a ton of things we need to have conversations about. Yes, and we're going to commit to do this. We're going to put into practice, not just Matthew 7, the Sermon on the Mount, this vision for a kind of life that he says is available to anyone from any background at any time. It's an unbelievable vision for life. And maybe you've come this morning or joining online, and this is the first time you're hearing some of these things And Jesus just wants you to know it's available to you. Yes, you. You who think there's no way, you're a first-round draft pick in Jesus' team. Or maybe there's others of you here and you remember when you used to be more on it with some of these things. And whatever, maybe it's the last 20 months have just been a relentless assault on your spiritual life. And if you were honest, you've just become distracted and drifted a long way, and maybe it's just a way too much bad crino going on, and you need a reset today. Or maybe you're somewhere in between. We want you to know this. This is a safe place. This is Jesus' place. We're not perfect. Here's what's very common amongst all of us here. We're all humans. Everybody in different stages of our journey. Everybody in different places are broken. We're all broken people. But a good number of us here who call Eagle home have found a Savior who says, come and follow me. We want to give our whole life to that. Who says a vision. I'm I'm all in with Jesus because no one says the things Jesus says and no one's done the things Jesus has done. I'm all in with him. And you can be too. Here's the muscle you have to work. Just say yes. Say, well, I did say that before, but I've wandered away. You know what I've found out every time I wander? Because guess what? Pastors wander too. I know I get paid not to wander, but sometimes I wander. (laughs) I get distracted. I get off track. I'm fallen. I'm fallible. I don't always get it right. You know when I wander? Guess the muscle you work? Come back. That's the muscle. Every wander, come back. I just want you to know, I got a really strong comeback muscle. (laughs) And maybe that's for you today. If you've been wandering and then just, ah, distract, just come back, just come back. Come back to Jesus, come back to his community, come back to spiritual friendships, just come back to him and start embracing his vision for your life and for our lives together. Can we do that? I think if we do, we might be quite surprised at the ripple effect of spiritual impact in a world. It's a whole lot better than just keep beating the bad crino drum. Let's give up on the bad crino. That's, 
There's a whole bunch of stuff done in Jesus' name that doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. It's under the banner of, banner of bad crino. And for some of you, that's what finds you. Like you've had experiences in church and religious circles, and it was bad crino done in Jesus' name. And this morning you get a picture of, that didn't have anything to do with Jesus. Yet, that's the point. It didn't have anything to do with Jesus. And that's the healing that needs to take place. And the caution is this. Don't toss Jesus out just because a whole bunch of junk was done in his name. Make sure you're making a wise and critical evaluation on the person of Jesus as revealed here. And not always perhaps what's modeled around you because we're fallen and broken people. And we're not always going to get it right. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for this passage that seems so timely for our day and age we're living. I pray for us as a community, by your grace, would you band us together to follow you, to stay devoted and faithful and committed to you, to submit ourselves to the authority of your word and your voice, that what you say matters most. I mean, it's just, you said it, that settles it. We submit ourselves to it. You are the King, the Lord, the Master, the Savior. And we trust you. And I just pray today as I close, I just pray for the one. Maybe there's someone listening today who just realizes they never maybe had a picture painted of what it means to say yes to Jesus. And today you got that picture. And you can just say yes to him from right where you are. You just say, yes, Jesus, I recognize I've got two by four size sin lodged in my soul. I admit it. I confess it. I'm a sinner. I desperately need grace. I come to you. Forgive me, Jesus. Take over my life. I want to live for you. I want to step into the reality of the vision of the kingdom of heaven. I want to live for you. Or maybe there's others today listening and you realize you've said yes to that. You've made a commitment to Christ, but it's just drift and distraction and caught up in all the wrong cycles. And today is a reset. And it's a comeback moment. And just work that muscle. Hey, Jesus, I come back. I'm coming back. And by your grace, stronger. Stronger. And I left. I'm coming back. And then for our world and for our nation and for our culture today, bring revival, oh God. Bring revival and awakening. Send a wide sweeping movement of your spirit across our land that will be unmistakable movement of God. We pray for that and we say to you, here we are. Use us to that end. In Jesus' name.